Hey, I'm Jake Sheridan, and you're listening to Duke Week, a new podcast covering Duke and Durham news from the Duke Chronicle. Every week, you're going to hear Chronicle reporters break down big stories, and you're also going to hear directly from newsmakers. It's the first week of class. I hope you've made it off the wait list. Today, we're going to talk with Dean of Students John Blackshear about how COVID might affect life at Duke this semester. We're also going to hear about how first year move-in went for my co-host, Matthew Griffin. But before we get to that, a star Duke professor is facing concerns about potential research malpractice. We've got the Chronicle's editor-in-chief, Leah Boyd, here to talk about it. Leah, thanks for coming on. Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me. So you wrote about some concerns over fraud and ambiguity in Duke professor Dan Ariely's work. Can you tell me who Dan Ariely is? Yeah, so Dan Ariely at Duke, he's the James B. Duke Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Economics. In general, he's known globally as a really profound behavioral economist, um, economist, I guess. A lot of his research focuses on irrationality. So when you do econ, you have the assumption that the consumer is rational, but he does a lot of behavioral economics and exploring why humans make decisions the way they do and how to kind of navigate that. He was named like, like a top 50 living influential psychologist in the world. He's appeared on several TED Talks. So his work on behavioral econ and psychology is known pretty globally. And he's, he, he's a pretty big professor at Duke as well. So what's he being accused of? Yeah, so the two works of his are under concern. One from 2004 um, contained ambiguous statistics that Ariel himself said he could not resolve. So that received an expression of concern in July. And then an analysis on a research blog known as Data Collada was published that kind of questioned the results of a 2012 study. And the analysis essentially found that the data in Ariel's study could not be attained except if it was fraudulent or kind of set up on its own. And there was some proof of emails being sent where the data was tampered with. You know, there was proof of formulas being used and you know, the study couldn't be replicated. So there were just some inconsistencies in the findings and they found that, that it was likely not done organically. So how did Ariely respond? Yeah, so Ariely released a public statement where he says, you know, he agrees with the conclusion of the data analysis and that he should have posted the data sooner to kind of help with accuracy and trust. He said that, you know, the data were collected and merged anonymized by the insurance company and that he had nothing to do with any of the merging or setting up the data. Um, He said he supports the effort of Duke to engage the Office of Research Integrity. He said, you know, I didn't suspect any problems with it, and he is committed to ensuring the researcher's integrity. He told the Chronicle himself that he had nothing else to add outside of that public comment. So it seems like he's pretty much compliant in that he claims he had no role in this. So what happens next? Yeah, so um, I guess in terms of the investigation, we asked if Duke and the Office of Research Integrity are working together. We haven't heard back. In terms of the Chronicle, you know, we're going to keep an eye on it. So this isn't Duke's first run in with research malpractice allegations, is it? So, yeah, in 2019, before, before I even graduated high school, Duke paid the U.S. government like $112, $112.5 million to settle accusations that it submitted fake data to get a research grant. That lawsuit was actually filed by a former Duke lab analyst. So not this isn't the Duke's first time. It's coming to, the, it's coming to play with allegations of false data. And as someone who cares deep, deeply about the scientific community being trustworthy, and, you know, especially in day and age where, you know, people are questioning the validity of science, I think it's my job to really serve as a watchdog and make make sure Duke holds up its end of being a research institution institution that puts out trustworthy data and upholds the high standards of the scientific community. And that's something I plan to keep holding them accountable to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Leah. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening. Are you interested in student journalism? Join our recruitment Facebook group to find out how you can get involved with the Chronicle this semester. There's no application or previous experience required. Anyone can get started, and anyone can write the next big story featured here on Duke Week. The link is cron.it slash join. All right, next we got Dr. John Blackshear. He's a man of many titles, among them Dean of Students, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs, and Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. He's also a clinical psychology professor and a faculty in residence. Hey, Dr. Blackshear, thanks for talking with us today. It's my pleasure, man. You know, uh, when I saw you called, I was like, here I go. Okay, calls, I'm coming in. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so students are coming back. Uh, we're still in a pandemic, but between vaccines and the Delta variant, a lot's changed over the last few months. How will this semester look for Duke students? Coming into this year, the beautiful thing is we know so much more about COVID that we did not know a year ago. 
Number two, um, you are right, the, the COVID continues to mutate and variants continue to uh, emerge. And number three, uh, we have uh, honestly one of the most highly vaccinated populations gathered here on campus than almost anywhere else you find. So it, the, the campus experience as, is already uh, incredibly different for students when they're here. Students are able to be here. They're able to be proximate to one another. And my expectation for how this will look different is there'll be a lot more opportunities for students to uh, receive their education in, purpose, in person. So we are obviously going to the in-person um, classes and there are opportunities for students to gather and build community, uh, much different than it was last year. But we will still have to do a lot of those things using uh, risk mitigators like masking, uh, and strongly encouraging those things and, um, you know, eating outdoors together uh, just so that we can sort of stave off any, you know, widespread um, infections with, the, with uh, the COVID variants. So what are the rules for students this semester? Right now, the rules are um, in common spaces, especially in dorms, uh, students are expected to be masked. Um, yeah, but in your dorm room, obviously not. Um, and when uh, groups are gathering in large groups outdoors, we'd like to see folks masking. But some of the other rules from last year, like number of people you can have in your house, those aren't on the books right now, are they? So uh, as far as you know, you being able to invite people into your room or the number of people who can be in your house or the number of people could be in a common space, the, those restrictions aren't in, in place. That doesn't mean that they won't be enacted if we, can, if we see spread in a way that, um, that, that we have to mitigate uh, infection among the body. You know, you mentioned that things could change. Of course, cases could go up or down. How might policies change throughout the semester? Um, you know, I think that if we are doing our part here in the community with masking and we see, um, you know, testing trends that show our students are doing really well, things could really relax, right? Especially once we're able to, um, you know, go even further with our vaccinations. And when um, some of our um, folks who are around are eligible for vaccinations. My anticipation is that we'll probably be a mask encouraged campus, we'll probably be an eating in small group and outdoor encouraged campus, uh, definitely mask in the classroom campus. I don't see us relaxing uh, you know, like masking in the classroom or something like that. Uh, but um, I don't anticipate we'll have the same sort of um, stringent responses that we that we that were necessary when we had everyone here unvaccinated over the like last year. That's that's mostly good news. <laughs> and, and again, you know, uh, now there, who knows? There may be a variant that comes through that breaks all through breaks breaks through vaccinations in ways that we don't anticipate currently. I'm telling you, I have been incredibly delighted. Masking is a part of our culture now. It's not as foreign as it was last year where folks just, you know, they toss them on. So I think that uh, the good news is people seem to get it. Um, do I expect everyone to be perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, we're all human beings and uh, we, we, we kind of, we have, we've been living in the state of pandemic for a year and a half. Um, and we also are, again, in this space, we're a highly vaccinated population, but we still have to be sort of vigilant about the spread because the vaccine does um, will sort of um, protect against, you know, potentially fatal um, uh, disease from COVID, but it doesn't, you know, protect against catching it. It doesn't protect against spreading it. And it doesn't protect against spreading to potentially vault the vulnerable among us. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Blackshear. It's my pleasure, and I appreciate you. All right, so we have Matthew Griffin here. He is the former editor in chief of The Chronicle, and he will also be co hosting this podcast, Duke Week, with me. Uh, Matthew, how's it going? It's going great, Jake. Thanks for having me on. You went and checked out First Year Move In this week. What do you see? I think the actually the part that was most noteworthy was how normal it looked. It looked a lot like a first year move in in past years. You have first year advisory counselors 
in neon colored shirts, lugging boxes around, screaming, cheering, singing along. You have a long line of cars on the East Campus Quad as parents and students wait to have their belongings moved into their dorms. And the reason that that's so remarkable is that move-in looked really different last year. It was spread out over four days. And so students didn't have this sort of celebration of coming to Duke and this first big moment that they all shared together, which both, you know, it, it's visibly very different and it felt very different. You know, one of the students who was a fact this year said it felt lonely last year to be one of the first students to move onto campus on that first day. Whereas this year, it really, it has this energy and this vibrant feeling as all of the students get to move in at the same time. So how did COVID affect move in this year? You can definitely tell that there is still a pandemic ongoing. Students had to get COVID-19 entry tests uh, to come to campus. That's first years and upperclassmen. Uh, and there are signs around campus reminding you of Duke's masking requirement. You also now have a Durham mask mandate. So as the Delta variant spreads, I think quite possibly there'll be more signs of COVID and of pandemic life with us than a lot of people would have hoped this semester. But still, it really does, it feels like the beginning of a year of college in a way that last year didn't. And it'll be interesting to see where things go from here as the semester progresses. So you wrote another article this week summarizing a bunch of different student resources. What do first years need to know? Yes, I think the big thing is to know that uh, there is information out there uh, for the questions that you're facing. You know, coming to college for the first time can be really confusing and, and people don't always know where to go, for example, for mental health resources. So that's something that the Chronicles put together a list. Uh, the Duke Student Government, I think in collaboration with the administration, has put together a, a list of, and a guide to those kind of resources. And so what we did uh, is just pull together a bunch of Chronicle reporting that tells you things like, you know, where do you go for mental health resources? What resources are available for students with disabilities? What, you know, campus groups should you know? What people should you know on campus? So that's a, a good place to get started if you want to get familiar with Duke. We also are always open to suggestions. If there's something that you find confusing about coming to college uh, that you don't find past Chronicle stories about, you know, email us. There's a, a tip page on our website. Tell us what you want to know. Well, thanks for coming on, Matthew, and we'll see you next week when you're hosting. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon, Jake. In other news this week, 84 attendees of the annual K Academy adult basketball camp were potentially exposed to Legionella, a bacteria that can cause a serious lung infection. No student athletes were exposed or infected. The National Science Foundation has announced the creation of an artificial intelligence research center at Duke, which will be supported with a $20 million grant. And Duke's sixth ranked women's soccer team beat number 13 Arkansas three to one in the team's season opener. It was the first game back with fans who hadn't been in the stadium since March, 2020. They replaced cardboard cutouts. That's all for this episode of Duke Week. Our intro song is called Goji Berry Beat by Nana Kwabina. If you want to reach out with suggestions, Hit me up on Twitter at Jake Sheridan underscore. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.